to now to the front pages and I'll take you through some of today's papers. The Sunday Times has this picture of the Queen uh, with her jewels and it says the Queen's jeweller pays no tax. That's their allegation there. And a terror witness, you might remember that phrase um, from the Leytonstone attack, you ain't no Muslim, bruv, nor am I. The man dubbed a hero says uh, he now fears retribution from ISIS. That's in the Times. The uh, jihadis must get the hell out of Britain is the story for the mail that you just heard there in the news. A world exclusive by the mail on Sunday. Uh, the story of Shaka Armour who spent 14 years in Guantanamo Bay tortured, he says, in the presence of British intelligence. The Sunday Telegraph has a very new look, Michelle Doherty, from uh, Downton Abbey. Uh, here in a US television drama as a thief whose life becomes entwined with a hitman. And their story is Cameron's climb down on EU benefits, what, what they're calling a climb down. The Tories warn that the Prime Minister is a thousand miles from an acceptable deal. One more, The Observer. A major leap uh, for mankind. It's uh, reflects on that deal coming out of Paris. Historic deal, nearly 200 countries signing up to climate change uh, efforts there. Well, with me to review the papers in a bit more depth, Shami, Colleen and Andrew, warm welcome uh, to you all. And uh, Colleen, start us off. You're going to take us through the, yes. the nitty-gritty of Paris. Well, the headlines are fantastic. Major leap for mankind, uh, climate deal. But, of course, the devil is in the detail. First, it needs to be ratified. You need 55% of the greenhouse gas emitting countries to sign up to it. And uh, secondly, it needs to be implemented. And so we've seen this before, for example, the Kyoto Protocol, where everyone had these fantastic um, emission requirements and targets, but they were targets and timetables that were sort of set through political horse trading. So the question is, how will that get implemented? They're talking about $100 billion to help countries. Uh, that's a lot of money. And it was one of the sticking uh, issues for the United States because they wanted legally binding financial commitments. And of course, the US can't do that. It's passed by Congress. And then the other is China and India uh, don't want to commit to it. They have a concept of common but differentiated responsibility uh, where they want everyone else to cut and they don't cut, but as we heard, China is the biggest emitter. And Andrew, when we're talking now about the action plan and 200, nearly 200 signatories to it, does it make you think, actually, the, the argument about scepticism towards climate change is now gone, that well, people have broadly moved towards saying, yes, this is happening and we're doing something. I think there's always going to be a healthy dose of scepticism. Of course there will. And the proof of this will be in the eating because, of course, a lot of this is not legally binding and therefore will there really be any major difference? Are India and China really going to reform the ways they trade? Um, I'm not so sure. But there are still a number of sceptics who don't believe in climate change, global warming, one of whom is very prominent, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's brother, Piers Corbyn, who I saw making a very eloquent mm. case on the BBC only the other day about why the whole thing is a fiction. Shami, uh, talk us through the spread that you've got on the uh, Shakurama on the uh, Sunday I Mail. I really do have to pay tribute to the Mail on Sunday today because I, my recollection is that no paper has been so consistent in campaigning for the closure of Guantanamo and indeed for, for, for Shaka Amma's uh, release. And you'll know that he was the last, uh, the last British resident in Guantanamo. He's only recently come home. Um, a wonderful, a wonderful spread uh, today. Ultimately very positive because you see this man who's been um, illegally interned in Guantanamo for 14 years, but nonetheless, uh, he doesn't seem bitter. He, he denounces terrorism. He, he makes the, the comments that you quoted uh, about, uh, about jihadis in Britain um, and, and, and is clearly, you know, a, a man of peace. However, there are some pretty serious allegations that, uh, that MI5 and indeed people who served in Mr Blair's government have to, have to answer. And uh, I guess we can look forward to, to hearing those answers in the, the weeks ahead. The allegations that British intelligence yeah. were in the room it's, it's, when he was being... So he talks about his torture, which includes things like having his head smashed against a wall um, during interrogation. And he talks about um, one agent in particular who called himself John, who, who said he was from MI5, mm. who had uh, a, a smart English accent. Um, the, the Mail on Sunday traces this incident back to, to a time um, when agents flew to Bagram with Mr Blair. Colleen, you were in the Bush administration at the time. When you read... The details that are coming out now from this account, where are you? Well, I think we have to remember that this was 2002, which was right after 2001, after the, after the um, 
9-11, I actually went down to Guantanamo twice, once with the head of the Belgian prisons and also with the um, UK Foreign Affairs Committee. And what you see at Guantanamo is completely different from what his story is about, which was when he was held in Bagram, which ironically was one of the reasons they set up Guantanamo, because they felt that Bagram, there wasn't the conditions to be able to hold people properly. So it's sort of, uh, I think we have to put that into context of, think of uh, Paris, like right after Paris. Right now, you have the you know, emergency situation. There you are... don't doubt, though, he's telling the truth about no, that... this torture. And we don't about... know. We don't know, because one of the trainings for Guantanamo detainees, for any jihadist, is to lie that you're being yeah. held but in what, conditions. But what is beyond doubt is this man was held without trial, without yeah. being told what he was supposed to have done for years. 14 years. It is a stain on America. Remember, remember it's a stain on America. Remember, you're using a criminal paradigm for what is laws of war, and that's where, as but Shami will know, it's Paris, the... It's it sounds like you're saying that that could happen again, that okay. the American administration might turn yeah. to this kind of... Yeah. No, absolutely ahead. wrong. You shouldn't do torture. It's it's illegal. We've signed uh, term, conventions on that. And what about internment without charge or trial for 14 years? Yeah. You can't possibly think that this has been helpful to America's Individuals cause. Individuals have been held in this country and other countries not under... They have committed a crime and therefore we're holding them in prison. In the Falklands, you didn't have individuals asking for their lawyer and being brought to the Old Bailey to stand it trial. Right, but is it right? So, well, that's what we have to figure out with this this new situation. Well, is, it isn't. It's and not a criminal situation, but it's. Look at Hollande. He said we're at war. But Obama, this is a Oba war. Obama said and he in was a war, running you for hold first. Individuals. Obama said when he was running for first term, he would close down mm. the shameful place tried. that is Guantanamo Bay. It's still open, and people are still being held there without knowing what they're supposed to. In my view, it has they, recruited. They it's probably recruited more terrorists than it's ever prevented. We're going it's, to come back to, yeah. to this story with Alex Salmond in a moment. But um, Andrew, if you just take us on to Cameron's migrant benefit, they're calling it a capitulation uh, in the Independent. They are. Well, it's, it's in a few papers. Too. Um, Europe is the issue which has bedeviled every Conservative Party leader since Margaret Thatcher. It now looks like the big uh, plus that C Cameron thought he'd, he'd shot the UK at Fox when he said there would be a referendum on our membership of the EU. It would be our first national referendum since 1975. In their own manifesto, the Tories said the minimum requirement of a renegotiation was to withhold in-work benefits for EU migrants for the first four years. Even his allies, the Poles, said no to that this week. He's gone all around Europe, running up air miles, and he's got no support for it. And he's going to a dinner in Brussels on Thursday. And frankly, he's going into the negotiations like the emperor with no clothes. Number 10 say it's still on the table. Yeah. They are not going to be able to deliver it. And you're a they are, They're resisting this very firmly, well, saying it's simply not true that he's giving up on it. Well, he's, he's got no support for it. And what's very interesting, in the Sunday Times, quoted on the front page, Dominic Cummings, a former aide to Michael Gove, who we know is a real Eurosceptic, that's the Justice Secretary. He's now mm. a big part of the Let's Get Out of the EU campaign. He said the Prime Minister sought trivia. That was all he was seeking, mm. and he hasn't even got that. Uh, Kelly, uh, take us on to what's possibly been the story of the week, or the long-running story of the week, um, those Trump comments. And <laughs> what seems to have happened now, um, Islamophobia is still fueling his success in the polls. Every time he says something, his attack on war hero John McCain, we all think this will be it. I mean, he comes out against, you know, puppies. He could say anything and they will and they will still support him. And, and I think part of it is a media situation because he's a household name in America. So when you're doing polling and you call people up, there's 14 individuals running for president mm. of the Republican side. How many can name them? So they say, well, mm. who do you like? And they go, um, you know, Trump. You know, he's on The Apprentice, he's known. I mean, he's the first name you remember. And then he's up in the polls, and because he's up in the polls, he gets media attention, and because he gets media attention, it's this, it's, it's sort of the Kim Kardashianization <laughs> of uh, American politics. But how worried do we need to be, yes. Kim? Can, can such a divisive <laughs> candidate actually win the presidency? Well, it, what you need to look at is, does he have a ground game? Meaning, does he actually have people out there that are ready to get out the vote? He doesn't have a lot of money there. He doesn't need a lot of money because he's getting all of this free right. press. The question so the people, politicians have been very quick to refute what he yep. said and to talk about yep. him as crazy. And yet, is he speaking to people's fears in America post San Bernardino? This is this is really, you know, what's at the heart of, of, of what yep. you're asking now. Maybe he is appealing it because he's saying me, something. It reminds me of Nigel Farage, where he was Farage was speaking to concerns that people felt the politicians weren't addressing. But when it came to actual elections, they didn't end up turning out for him as everyone had predicted. So that's the thinking on Trump is he is expressing things that uh, individuals think politicians are afraid to address for political correctness. Mm -hmm. 
he's out there being bold and, and uh, sounding decisive, but getting out the vote will be another thing. Shami, I want to call this a, a major leap forward for Saudi women. It's probably too dramatic to go that far, but at quite a turning point when they've actually been given a vote. Well, Saudi women get to have, have been able to vote in some local elections, but nonetheless, it's 2015, and finally, some Saudi women got to vote. Big uh, PR coup uh, for, for, the, for the car, the, the, the taxi company Uber, because they, um, of course, women can't drive mm. in Saudi Arabia, so they yep. provided free uh, free lifts to the polling stations. But it is a small it is a small step. Um, because it's just local elections. Women were able to stand as candidates, but of course not to campaign openly, not to they be in the have company to speak of to men. A man. Exactly. So um, um, yes, it's a, it's it's a moving moment, but it's um, goodness me, it's not anywhere near. It's enough. a baby step. Yeah. Hopefully, just getting the right to drive would be nice. That would be good. Wouldn't I thought it? I thought all men should wear um, wigs. So that then like Donald Trump. Stopping ever no, not like Donald no, Trump. No, he's got real but hair. Yeah. Long, it's long, real. I okay, felt sorry. it. I've long been hair. invited to pull his hair. Um, there oh. you go. Your fact for the morning. Is it really his? It really is. Oh, right. All the way. I mean, that was okay. as close as I wanted to get. Do we have that on video? There. You yeah. pulling his hair? I think you probably <laughs> do somewhere. <laughs> that, um, that's going to go viral. Yeah, Andrew, talk, talk to us about this move by um, Andy Corbyn, who his critics are calling a move to get moderates, yes, not as on the left as Corbyn, yeah. into this party under the sort of widening of, of the membership rule. This, what, is a, this, this is a story in the, in the Telegraph. Um, Corbyn, we know, was elected on a huge wave of popular support in the Labour Party. Lots of people signed up for £3 and as associate members. So if there was a leadership contest, just say, in a couple of months' time, he'd probably win with a bigger majority because he's more popular than ever with Labour Party members. So what the moderates are suggesting, they're saying that actually we need to get 100,000 people um, who are more of the centre yeah. of the Labour Party so that at some point, uh, when there is a leadership challenge, they've got ammunition. It doesn't say, though, which leader potentially they're going to rally yeah. behind. I think you need to have a leader. Or whether the moderates are all are queuing up to Are they there? Because some of them might want to go to another party. This but language is very loaded, though, isn't it? Who is a moderate? Who well, is quite. the centre? You know, um, well, you know, some what? of the people who feel they're going to be deselected by Jeremy yeah. Corbyn would say they're the moderates, yeah. people like Tristram Hunt, the shadow mm. who was Shadow Education yeah. Secretary. Uh, Michael Dugra is, uh, is quoted... Uh, oh, no, that's in another story. But um, uh, I suspect it's, it's a bold attempt, but 100,000, it's a lot. Clever. Very clever. Let's, let's finish on, on, on a sparkling moment um, from you, Colleen. We, we don't know what to call our champagne, do we? Just go with it, champagne. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, wonderful that there is now the uh, idea of champagne being grown in Britain, particularly in England. Tattinger takes the headlines here, but uh, Nye Timber is uh, mm. a well-known brand and it, it, that actually was started by two gentlemen from California that came over and said, hmm, the soil here, it's, you share the continental shelf, it's the same soil as in France, the why not grow it here? I, I drank it, it's very and nice it's champagne. This is disgraceful. But you are, you are just touting to have someone send you a case of this stuff before uh, Christmas. Well, I, I know what I you're up to. I don't find the green room. I think graphic. you might be disappointed after this. <laughs> but I love it because we drink so much of it here, it's like, you know, we should be we should be dominating the market. Why not? Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for coming in.